Review and teardown this time. This is a Jesverti Lab Power Supply. It's the SPS 3010, uh, up to 30 volts output and up to 10 amps of capability on current. Um, it's a typical lab power supply. When you turn it on, you can adjust the voltage uh, on the output. There's a course adjust on the right hand side, which lets you get it about where you like it. And then to dial it in perfectly, there's a fine adjust on the left hand side. Below here, there's a current set. Uh, current setting is quite helpful to allow power supply. If you're doing prototyping, if you don't want an accidental short to burn everything up, you can sometimes set a nice low current limit, save your circuit. Another really popular use of it is if you are trying to charge a battery and you need to keep the current below a certain point. Now, unlike a lot of power supplies, which might have an adjustment button for setting the currents, on this one, you have to keep the voltage below five volts and short the output. And then just like the voltage, there's the course adjustment knob on the right hand side and a fine adjustment knob on the left hand side. Another unusual feature, it looks like there's a USB-A connector here with up to a 10 watt uh, 5 volt uh, connection, uh, which could be quite helpful. So in some ways it's a dual output power supply. Let's uh, review the performance of the unit and then we'll tear it apart and look at the construction. Uh, it's the best-selling unit that was on Amazon when I bought it, so obviously it has uh, lots of people purchasing it, and uh, it's quite sharply priced. Let's see what you get for your money. So the first thing to check uh, is what happens when you turn it on. Does the voltage go to where you hope it to be? If you notice you press the power button, uh, it, it goes, like it says, 80 volts almost instantaneously before it goes to the 4.5 volts it's set. Let's put this on an oscilloscope and uh, see if that's true or not. Okay, the power supply is off and I turn it on. Uh, you can see it comes up and uh, this is fine. This is actually good. It's monotonic, doesn't overshoot, uh, reaches the voltage that's desired. And then uh, if I turn it off, you notice there's probably a fair bit of capacitance on the output. See how slow it is to come down to zero. That might be a bit of a problem, but we'll look at that in a moment. Uh, but it seems to be actually quite stable, uh, no matter what you do for the power cycling, it always seems to come up and uh, and never overshoot. So uh, even though the display there was showing a kind of a scary number, it looks like it's pretty stable on uh, this one here. So the power supply is rated to be a, a 10 amp at 30 volts or 300 watts. As you can see, that's exactly what it's displaying. And uh, if I just check on my clamp on ammeter, 9.89. So maybe the panel meter is a slight bit less. But uh, yeah, it's definitely uh, meeting its specs at the high end. And if you notice, it's actually quite quiet. But uh, if this runs for a bit, there it goes. The fan turns on, so I really appreciate that. There is a fan in the unit uh, when it's running maximum power. Uh, but it only turns on when it's necessary. That's certainly a really nice feature in a supply. So with the supply at 10 amps, I turn it on and turns off. Now, of course, it falls very quickly because it has such a heavy load. Same good behavior, though. It's not overshooting or undershooting. So, uh, so far, the supply is looking uh, pretty darn okay. So let's uh, keep on stress testing it. So now I've got it set at a much lower voltage, uh, 2 volts, but at the full 10 amps. Uh, of course, drawing about 20 watts. Let's see if the power supply reacts well at the uh, lower voltages as well. So I turn the supply off, I turn it on, off, on. Um, you can actually see uh, there's actually a little bit of a glitch occasionally. And let me just pause the oscilloscope and we'll, we'll frame that. So when it's producing 2 volts, you can see I turn the supply on, it has a little bit of a bounce there. Uh, but more, a little more significant bounce. It's oh, ever so up, up above the 2 volt line. Uh, not so seriously actually. There's some really crummy supplies out there on uh, the internet you can buy. Um, their so-called lab power supply has been not very good at all. This is slightly out of spec, perhaps, but uh, it's actually not too, too bad. The reason, of course, you don't want this thing to overshoot your set voltage if you're doing a circuit uh, design without any protection, usually. Of course, that anything overshooting where uh, you set the voltage and when you turn the supply on uh, could cause problems. Now, yeah, this is like 2 volts. That's only about uh, 550 millivolts. So not, not too significant, but worth noting. Okay, let's take a look at the construction of the power supply. Uh, the first thing we do is look at the back here and we look at the markings. It claims it's got conformance to the European regulatory standards. Uh, FCC is the American in radiated emissions. Uh, unfortunately, there's no uh, UL, CSA, uh, or any similar type of TUV. There's no sort of marking which would indicate that the supply has been tested to a national standard. Unfortunately, CE marking, although it should guarantee that, it's a self-declared conformity. Uh, and we'll take this thing apart and see how close it is, but uh, 
it hasn't met its uh, safety testing. Otherwise, the fuse holder here, standard power input, and let's take the cover off and look at the construction. Okay, obviously the cover's off. Uh, the first thing I want to check is how they handle the safety on the uh, AC input. You can see a green and yellow striped wire coming down. Let me just zoom in. So what you can see down there is a, a crimped connection going onto the chassis. That's so important. Occasionally you see uh, non-approved designs. They use a soldered connection. Of course, the whole idea of the safety wires to carry current until the circuit breaker uh, can go uh, in the house or the factory. And uh, crimps, of course, uh, won't loosen up, but if that was soldered, it could have weakened. That's good. Uh, European color code going here are the uh, brown and blue uh, scenario. Looks like the AC gets carried right out to the switch here, so this is not a soft switch, actually. It it's, uh, actually takes the 110 volts um, and then comes onto the main board. Okay, let's uh, take a further look what's going on at the inputs. Uh, this white connector here is basically the 110 volts coming in. This is a NTC resistor negative temperature coefficient. Basically, it can provide a uh, high resistance until it warms up. Uh, that's a good sign, uh, basically, to turn the power supply on. There's going to be an inrush current uh, trying to charge all the capacitance of the supply. The uh, purpose of this resistor, of course, is to prevent that from getting too high of a current. Uh, looks like we have a capacitor here and a couple of coils. This is almost certainly a common mode choke. Uh, that makes certain that the, any noise in the power supply doesn't get uh, conducted back. Now, the reason all this is kind of significant is that these are in some ways optional in a sense. Uh, they're required for regulatory approval and for a well-behaving power supply. Uh, but of course, uh, when we get to really sketchy uh, products, sometimes these things get deleted. But uh, here they are all present and all correct. So building confidence, this is a reasonably well put together uh, product. Uh, the other thing, of course, you instantly notice this is not a linear power supply, it's a tiny little transformer. Uh, it's a switching class trans, uh, switching class uh, power supply. Uh, lab supplies generally uh, should be linear because that's a little more difficult to control noise, but uh, the performance is entirely admirable in this one. Uh, other things you can see, of course, you can see here is the uh, current sense. Uh, it's basically just a chunk of wire that's been precision formed. Uh, cooling fan, of course, which uh, cools these uh, switching transistors here. Um, and, uh, you know, there's not much more to say. The, the design topology looks entirely okay, and uh, the workmanship is good. Uh, all the soldering is clean and bright. Uh, looks like there's some hand soldering here. I'm not sure if that was because of the part wouldn't be placed on the waste solder, or if they did a rework, but again, it's done correctly. So, uh, the only thing you can really find is that this case is painted here, and it's painted the edges here. So, of course, this metal case has to make uh, contact to the case. So. Uh, the only thing I'm going to do in this case is just sand that off a little bit to make sure that the top case uh, covers correctly. You obviously want the, uh, the case bonded to the uh, chassis ground. So just taking a look at the circuit boards on the front uh, here. Uh, there's one uh, unit here for the displays. This is a LED driver and there's a little small uh, microprocessor which I suspect converts uh, the voltages to the display. Um, does the calculation of math for creating uh, wattages. Uh, a circuit uh, board here just for those uh, potentiometers for the adjustments, not uh, too unusual. Okay, leaves the final board down here. The uh, banana jack uh, connectors uh, coming in, the wire, of course, coming in, not too surprising. A uh, couple of things of note, though. You can see a fairly large capacitor that's been tacked on the output, and of course that helps with the stability of the power supply. It's also responsible that when we turn the power supply off uh, at the very start of this video and at a very slow decay rate, and that's because there's a lot of capacitance sitting on the output. Um, this is, I suspect, a trade-off you have to make with the switching supply. If you open up, say, a much older Hewlett-Packard linear power supply, who are kind of the gold standard for lab supplies about 40, 50 years ago, uh, you'll see a significantly reduced capacitance in the output. Um, having said that, you know, the, the product still uh, performed relatively well. The other thing of note is this is the connection to the chassis ground, soldered in, unfortunately. And again, it probably should have been crimped with a ring terminal onto the banana jack. The reason for that is if you start carrying significant currents on your safety ground before the breaker uh, goes, you don't want that solder to warm up and loosen the wire connection to break. You really want it to hold hard with good low um, impedance until the breaker can act. And that can be a some number of um, milliseconds depending on the breaker. So I suspect it would be a bit stronger there if that had been crimped on. All right, well, a brief look at the diversity, uh, what is it called? A uh, SPS3010N. 
Uh, the performance was entirely uh, acceptable. Uh, the construction internally doesn't seem to expose any significant concerns. So um, this was actually, I think, a pretty good buy.